Hello everybody. In this talk, we will discuss how to build fault to tolerant distributed applications with Temporal. My name is Tehomir. I'm a developer advocate at Temporal, and I'm also the project lead of the CNCF serverless workflow project. So a table uh, of contents. First, we will give a quick introduction to Temporal. We'll discuss how you use Temporal to build resilient microservices. We will also take a look at the polyglot aspect of building microservices using Temporal, as well as some of the error handling features that it includes. In the end, I will present a demo to kind of tie it all together. So Temporal is an open source distributed microservice orchestration platform. And to get you started, here are some links like the website, docs, community forum, and things like that. Temporal is used by a ton of different companies out there. And if you want to learn more and see more use cases and types of applications those companies are building using Temporal, you can go to this link and see a bunch of different case studies. So to give an introduction to Temporal, Temporal is composed of two main parts. One is the server, Temporal server, and one is the SDKs. On the left-hand side on the server, it's basically a Golang binary that can be deployed on many different ways. So for example, Kubernetes, Docker, or really any of infrastructure that you might have available. In addition to that, Temporal also provides some, a cloud offering that you can use if you want to use that deployment rather than one that you do locally yourself. On the right-hand side, as far as the SDKs goes, Temporal, uh, provides a programming language model to building your business logic and applications, also uh, called workflows, which are kind of like units of execution. And you can write them uh, using programming languages. So you can use Go, PHP, Java, Node.js currently. And again, those applications that you build using programming languages can <laughs> be um, deployed on any framework or infrastructure, just like currently that you're you know, using to build your applications. So looking at the temporal server, um, the temporal server itself is composed of multiple different services. You can scale out the temporal, ser temporal server horizontally, but for example, deploying multiple um, servers on different clusters, uh, but each service individually can, can be scaled as well. Now, just to take a little quick look into the different parts of the temporal server, uh, we have the front end service. So all the communications of your client applications and your services can communicate to the temporal server via gRPC calls. And the front end service handles basically all the inbound calls and allows for things like multi-cluster replication and things like that. The history service manages workflow state transitions, meaning that uh, temporal server does not execute your code directly. However, it assists uh, during this execution in terms of storing some sort of important events, execution events that then later on allow you to either resume workflow or your uh, application execution and deal with things like failures and stuff like that. The matching service provides host task queues, which are basically endpoints dynamically generated through which you can host multiple types of workflows or type of services at some particular endpoints. And in the end, the worker service is a background processing temporal server includes a bunch of different background uh, system workflows and replication queues and things like that in order to achieve uh, what we will take a look in the next couple of slides. As far as storage goes, again, a temporal does not store um, anything, uh, your application's uh, code or some sort of serialized application code. No, all your code runs actually on your applications as we'll see soon, but the server storage still stores some information like events and the history of the execution of your different services and applications. Uh, Temporal currently provides, as far as storage go, goes Cassandra, MySQL, and PostgreSQL, and the scaling of your database really depends on the database use. So if you're using Cassandra, your scaling options would probably be somewhat different than, for example, Postgres. <clears throat> I'm sorry. Um, observability is very important when we start writing any sort of uh, microservice or any polyglot type of service or distributed service stuff. So both the server and the temporal SDKs provide out of the box, provide metrics. 
And these metrics can then be consumed by things like Prometheus and Grafana, and you can build um, um, your dashboards and, and, and metrics um, visualization that way. In addition to that, the temporal SDKs also provide tracing information. So during execution of your application and services, you can uh, view the tracing information, for example, with Jaeger, whatever your tracing type of uh, software is that you want to use. Now, I like to kind of like display the use of temporal from a point of view of, of a particular user. In this case, let's focus on a developer. As developers, we want to really be able to focus on our business logic. And when we're dealing with writing very complex um, applications, especially distributed microservices, we have to deal with a ton of different things. With temporal, as a developer, you really can focus on writing your own code. And the temporal server on the right-hand side in the box is basically, you can think of it as a black box that provides you things like event handling, um, durable timers, durable storage, transaction management, queuing, analytics, and as we have shown previously, metrics. So all the things you get out of the box are really your applications. You can write simple code um, and you have all those benefits um, that you can utilize uh, as far as what the temporal server provides. Now, given, of course, some scaling options and deployments, the temporal server is capable of executing hundreds of millions of these applications that we call workflows concurrently. Um, as we said, temporal server does not directly execute your code. Your code still executes on your premises and your deployment, um, you know, uh, the way you deploy your applications, but it tracks and management, uh, manages its execution state and um, its application uh, kind of flow. Now, as far as, again, looking at it from developer perspective, um, we can utilize the temporal SDKs to write our applications in different types of languages. As we said, Go, PHP, Node, and Java. And each one of these SDKs provide APIs for use that we can utilize during development, such as develop, you know, workflow development APIs, testing APIs, and also client APIs. Um, because Temporal, again, it takes a programmatic approach rather than some sort of DSL or high level type of uh, workflow language, we write our code uh, as developers still in our favorite IDE. So we don't have to get out of our environment. We don't have to change our programming language use. We can stay within the same type of environment that we're used to. Um, so what are we kind of targeting? You know, what are we as developers, what do we have to write? And he has three things really. The first one is workflows. So workflows are implementation of business logic. So this is just code, you know, with some restrictions that we will go over that you have, you can write in order to execute your business logic, most likely orchestrate some third party services or things like that. Uh, the workflow code that we write is becomes fault, fault tolerant because of temporal. Um, and there is many different things like configuration-based retries, timeouts, uh, compensation, and all those things that temporal through SDKs and, and with addition to the server that kind of manages these things uh, allow you to have out of the box as well. The second thing are activities. Um, so activities are basically parts of your code that, where you can use you know, any sort of library, uh, database access, file access, you can do pretty much anything you want there. Um, so activities um, can be, of course, invoked sync or async without you really having to specify any of that information in your code or use some sort of third-party libraries uh, for that. It can be rate limited. Um, and of course, you know, with Temporal, you get automatic retries without having anything to specify in your application as far as uh, coding for it goes. The third things are workers. Workers are uh, processes that host your workflows and activities. Um, and workers are responsible for execution and, and progress of execution of both your workflows and activities. Workers then communicate with the Temporal server and <laughs> that communication um, is important in order to, to, to run, invoke, and in, in running and continuing and resuming your workflow execution, as we'll see also in the later slides. 
in addition to uh, the SDKs and, and the programming model, uh, Temporal also provides for developers um, a web UI through which you can see, you know, you know what's going on, what workflows are running, what state they're in, their execution history, stack traces, and stick like, things like that. But in addition, it provides a CLI, which is probably even more powerful, where you can use to do a lot of different things. Like again, start workflows, and you can have your batch executions of things and stuff like that. As far as testing and debugging goes, which is important, um, again, you can use your IDEs and the standard testing and debugging libraries and, and, and the debuggers of your choice. There is nothing special that you have to download or use in particular. Uh, as far as testing goes, you can test both your workflows and in activities, and you can use your uh, mocking libs that you want to use to mock things like that. And important thing about testing workflows is because you might have workflows that are running for weeks, months, or even years, so long running type of execution. Temporal testing framework provides a time advanced feature, which allows you to test even workflows that might be running for multiple years within milliseconds. So that's kind of like an important thing to understand that you can really test any sort of uh, application or service that you write with Temporal easily. As far as activities goes, they can be tested and, and, and debugged independently. And uh, again, because of the testing framework that, that Temporal provides for most of uh, SDKs, you do not have to even have the Temporal server running in order to test um, your code. Now, from kind of like an architectural perspective or a little bit higher um, up view, uh, we have to ask ourselves, can we, if we start adopting a temporal, can we still use frameworks that uh, we're accustomed to and that we currently want to use? And the answer is yes, temporal is not intrusive in this way whatsoever. Uh, we talked about this, can I use already, can I use my current programming language? And the answer is yes. What about the dev environment? And again, we kind of went through that for both testing and debugging and also writing your code, that's the case. And can I use my... Um, testing libraries uh, that I'm already currently using, such as JUnit, PHP Unit, Testify. And again, yes, you can, because Temporal does have the programming language approach, you can use all those libraries and, and tools as well. So that's uh, kind of one perspective of looking at, let's say, uh, writing a new applications and, and things like that. But what if we have an existing application? And typically this is kind of like the, we have some data model, uh, we have some inventing platforms that we're using. Our application itself in the middle in the box can provide some sort of object model and code that we currently might have that communicates with, for example, third-party systems and different UIs in order to accomplish our business logic or end goal of our application that we provide to our customers. So once, if we wanted to incorporate Temporal into the mix, what we have to really pick and choose is which parts of our code, mostly that, you know, the uh, business logic, the core business logic uh, code executions or the orchestration of, for example, these services and UIs, we want to turn into workflows and which parts of our code that currently interact with different file system, database access, invocation, REST, or, you know, async, sync, invocation <clears throat> of these third-party systems we want to turn into activities. So finally, what is the value proposition of Temporal? The, the value proposition is that uh, no matter what, you, what we do or what our title is in the end, we build services or microservices in general. Um, and these services have to be durable, distributed, scalable, and of course, polyglot in most cases, and, and, and that's up to you. But Temporal provides it for you. It really allows you to focus on writing your business logic, <clears throat> without having to think about all those benefits that you get pretty much for free. So let's take a look at a quick example. This is a Java example. Uh, again, the portal provides us the case in, in different languages. But on the left-hand side, let's say that we have an existing class called my customer um, that has some state. For example, it holds a customer and it has a main method called update account, um, account message. Uh, where we want to update some information uh, about this customer. It also has two methods on the bottom side called get customer 
which allows us to receive information of the customer we're currently processing. And it has an exit method where um, basically that method allows us to stop processing if that needs to be. As you know, we're dealing with Java, we have some sort of interface, my customer interface that are my, our my customer class implements. And this is kind of like the blueprint that has the three main methods of the account message, get customer and exit. So in order to turn that into a temporal workflow, really we have to start with the interface. So we just use annotations, for example, at workflow interface. Uh, which basically says that any class that implements this particular um, interface should be considered a workflow. The update account message, which is kind of like the core method or the main method of our class that implements this business logic is annotated with workflow at workflow method. And our uh, method get customer, which uh, allows uh, different clients to get this information from workflow is a query method. And our exit, which is basically receives a signal, an outside signal or data that we want to receive uh, when during execution of, uh, of this class, we annotate with that signal method. So with that itself, our class on the left-hand side has become a temporal workflow. And two things we have to take a look at. How do we actually interact now with our workflow? How do we start it, stop it? And how do we get information out of it? And how do we signal, for example, send signals to it, as well as how do we write this business logic that we want to actually implement uh, this class with. So let's take a look now at some of the temporal features provided by the temporal SDK and, and, and their APIs. The first thing that you get out uh, from the temporal uh, APIs is, for example, you can start workflow execution and you, you can be long running. So on the left-hand side, for example, we show that, hey, we want to start uh, a workflow execution implementation of your business logic, and we're gonna let it run you know, up to a year. Um, workflow has state, and the state you don't have to deal in your code yourself as far as actually writing some sort of calls to databases or persisting yourself. That is done uh, through temporal. Again, it's not the actual class, uh, your code that's persisted, but it's event history, and we'll take a look at that a little later on as well. Um, your workflow code can be fault tolerance. On the left-hand side, see that we can have automatic retries for activities. We can have retries for your workflows. You can reset your workflows, cancel, terminate, things like that. There's APIs for that. And also because this is programming language approach, you can you know, try catch and you can catch some uh, certain exceptions to even perform things like compensation before uh, ending your workflow execution. We can also define through the APIs that we want periodic execution via some cron, for example, and we can invoke workflows and as well also as activities, sync or async. So Temporal provides full support. And in some programming languages, it is the default approach to, to actually invoke things async itself. Uh, finally, we all know that, especially when you have long running business logic or workflows, um, you need some sort of versioning. Uh, th changes happen, so temporal APIs provide you a way to version your code even while it's currently even running and deploy a new version and, and, and uh, deal with updates um, automatically. Um, we, of course, we, we talked about testing already. So again, all your workflows activities or any code that you write using the temporal APIs is fully testable. Now let's take a look a little bit how we interact with our workflows. So on the left-hand side, let's say we some, have some sort of client application, a client that actually wants to invoke an instance of our business logic or our workflow, workflows that we develop in our services. So the client API can send commands. Those are again, um, commands they are based on gRPC and we send them to the temporal server to its front end service. So one of the commands that we can send is start but there are many more we can signal, query, cancel, things like that. So on the left-hand side, let's say we have some code that actually uses the temporal Java SDK and its APIs to call a workflow client.start. This is an async invocation uh, that we request this for, for the server. The server itself uh, at this point does not really know what service or our service is actually going to execute or, or pick up 
the request to start a workflow execution. But what the server does, it's going to put a message into a particular task queue. Now, our application, our service on the bottom left that we're writing that includes our workflows and activities and our workers, our, we tell our workers to listen to this particular last task queue. And then when a message arrives, or in this case, on the right-hand side, a little red circle, uh, that includes some information about wanting to start workflow execution arrives, our work is going to pick it up, is going to read the instructions and start the execution of our, uh, our new workflow instance. So this is a fully distributed system. Um, uh, workflow execution that starts, let's say on our service here on the bottom left side, can actually during some time continue on a completely different service. If in case of a failure, in case this particular service goes down and things like that. So you see temporal and it's, it's, it's fully distributed, meaning that uh, you have um, the ability to actually uh, built in fault tolerance and re reliability, things like that into you know, your whole equation without really having to uh, write their code it yourself. Now, once, uh, our task worker has picked up the initial task to start the workflow. It started processing to some point where it needs some more information from the server, for example, schedule an activity execution or start creating a timer in case where our workflow says, let's say, sleep for 10 minutes or 10 days. Um, our workflow uh, can send, uh, again, a message to the portal server say, basically saying, I want to schedule an activity execution. The activity itself, because again, distributed system does not have to be even executed within our service, but could be a completely different service that hosts the particular activity. And again, temporal server is going to put uh, a task on a specific task queue that we request and is going to be pick picked up by some worker and execution is going to move forward with that. Um, uh, just going a little bit into this uh, more, we talked that Temporal is a very resilient system. And once the message arrives from the task queue and the worker picks it up, on the left-hand side, let's say we have a workflow code uh, that we want to execute. The message that itself or the workflow task includes things like what should be executed next and all the history and information that's happened so far. Um, on the left-hand side, once this task can, uh, uh, workflow task is received, we use the past events or the workflow history to put the workflow in the same state that it was before the task was received. And again, a, a, this workflow can be uh, re, you know, replayed or the ex its state can be placed into, into uh, right before the, uh, the workflow task was received on a completely different machine. Uh, once we have replayed and put the workflow state into the exact position where we need it, we can use the what's next part in order to continue workflow execution from that point on. Um, again, if this workflow history can place the state in the same uh, state it was before, it was it's called deterministic, so we can move on with the uh, with the execution. If the event history does not match, for example, we made some changes to our code without versioning it, uh, we can run into some non-deterministic errors as well. And Temporal Server will let you know and still give you the chance to fix the error and not just fail your workflows. So let's take a look now at service orchestration. This is kind of like a common way where we have, let's say a food delivery service written in any programming language for which Temporal has SDKs where we want to basically with the use of temporal server orchestrate some third party services on the right hand side, like dispatch service, restaurant service, payment service, and things like that. So, with temporal, you can deal with intermittent failures, uh, meaning that if some of those third per ser party services are down, uh, does not mean that we have to um, fail uh, if that happens, or doesn't really mean that we have to write any code in order to deal with these particular errors. Uh, with temporal, server and, and it's as the case you can deal with intermittent failures without any worry and you can actually fix those errors um, and and for example issue retries until those particular services um, come back up and are available and other things that we uh, temporal provides is dealing with continuing failure let's say in this case our payment service is down and it's not coming back up in this case we can deal with this error 
and actually do things like compensate their workflow and do some other things in order to, to uh, deal with this particular uh, permanent or continuing failure as well. Another thing that Temporal allows you to do is rate limit the services you're invoking. So even though in this case, these are third party and we don't um, particularly have anything to do with the code or the services itself, we're just using them. We still through Temporal Server can rate limit. So for example, if the payment service has a cost associated with it, and we don't wanna go, for example, over 100, invoking it 100 times per second or per day or whatever the time is, you can define this rate limiting in your application and uh, Temporal Server will make sure that the rate limit uh, operations <coughs> are followed. Um, another kind of way of looking at this is, let's say we have two services that both um, um, are uh, talking through the Temporal Server, our food delivery service, and let's say our dispatch service. In this case, we can rate limit our applications ourselves, so we can define rate limiting in our own service code. Uh, we can still deal uh, with um, error and propagation across the services. So as in before where we had third-party services, we had to deal with things like HTTP errors, like 404 without really having any ability to gain some specific errors. If you have different services that are using Temporal, you can have very, very powerful error handling and propagation that we will see here in a minute. In addition to that, uh, one service that we write with Temporal can be written in, let's say, Go, and the other service that we write that might be a different team could be write in, written in Node.js. Um, and really, in addition to what we can do is we can have uh, even further where our workflow, for example, could be written in one language, our worker can be written in a different language, and on the service B side, we can have our activities again written in different. So if, as far as the polyglot aspects go, the temporal server is able to serialize and deserialize the data and also the workflow information so that we can have this polyglot type of in, uh, in for, um, collaboration and communication, including um, error message and propagation and things like that across distributed services in different programming languages as well. So let's take a look just for a minute at um, as far as polyglot goes, as far as air handling. Let's say on the left-hand side, we have our food service and our workflow uh, and activity written in Go. And our, our application starts by making an instance of our food delivery workflow. This workflow, let's say, calls our activity. And then this activity through the temporal server and, and the temporal SDK APIs, client APIs, invokes a re the restaurant service that's written in Node.js. And the same thing here, we go again and the restaurant service activity invokes uh, the payment service activity, which is in this case, let's say written in PHP. Now in systems or distributed systems like this, um, let's say <laughs> in our payment service, we have an error or an exception happens. Typically, you know, our food delivery service is going to have no idea what actually happened and will not be able to receive the proper information of what, where, and how uh, things broke in order to be able to, let's say, compensate for it or fix the error. When you're using Temporal, the payment service actually we uh, has, uh, through the Temporal server, error propagation. So we are going to propagate that <laughs> error from PHP uh, to the restaurant service uh, written in Node.js. Then we can propagate that error back to the restaurant service workflow and then back to the food delivery service, um, which is again written in Go and its workflow. So when this error propagates back all the way to where we started um, uh, our, our execution, this error is going to be able to have all the details, specifically the servers that it failed, all the information that the payments is added to the exception as well as the original exception and all the things that, uh, the, for example, the restaurant service added to the air. And again, when we catch this error and get it back in our food delivery service, we know exactly what failed um, and how to deal with a particular error. All right, so we come to the demo part. In this case, I wanted to demo the resilient server orchestration 
by showing actually a temporal workflow that invokes similarly to what we've seen in the slides before uh, a couple of our services. So in this case, we have a patient onboarding workflow and below is um, the URL, GitHub URL, where you can um, clone it and run this project yourself. All right, so let's get started. Um, in our case, what we have is first our services. So let's go ahead and show you that. We have a, a patient onboarding service, which has three endpoints, assign a doctor, assign a hospital, and notify a patient. So basically with the service that we want to write or the core business logic is to invoke this particular or orchestrate invocations of uh, the patient onboarding service and it endpoints in order to onboard uh, a customer. We also have an application that we're running that's running our workflow. So let's take a look at the workflow itself. Uh, the workflow is written in Java. It's an onboarding implementation. And it basically has a bunch of different activities that executing in order. So first we're going to assign hospital to a patient. We're going to assign a doctor to a patient. We're going to notify the patient um, that you know, we have assigned them to a doctor and uh, the hospital. And we have a final onboarding step that we want to perform. Um, so let's take a look at our application also has a UI. So our UI is basically, you know, very simple. We have some patient information. So let's say we have a customer called a uh, patient called John. Um, let's see, he has a zip condition. So they have asthma, John at com. And let's say 555 and prefer contact method is text. So once we uh, actually press this onboarding patient, we're going to communicate with the temporal server to ask it for a creation of a workflow instance. Um, our application here that also hosts our workflow and activities and the workflow worker is going to pick up the task from the temporal server and execute this particular workflow. So let's go ahead and do that. As we do that, UI shows all the activities. So for example, we are signing currently a hospital to John. We're signing a doctor, and this is again per our instructions in the workflow. We're notifying the patient, and then we're going to finalize the onboard. Once we're done with that, we can see that our UI updated, and we see that our patient John was assigned a hospital and a doctor and has been successfully onboarded. Uh, if we look at the temporal web UI, we also see, for example, that we have a particular workflow that is in status complete. It's our onboarding workflow. And we also can have the history such as we can see the input, which is the form input that we typed into our form, as well as can see the results. They're also we displayed on the page. In addition, as we talked about, this is the actual history of all the execution information that was stored within the temporal server and is able to uh, have the ability to actually resume workflows from a particular failure. So let's go ahead and do this one more time. Let's say uh, we have Mary, uh, let's say they have headaches. Uh, I'm just gonna type in something here. Uh, now what we want to do is uh, show failure. So let's say, for example, we start our workflow execution and we're going to stop or fail our services during the execution of our workflow. So what we have done, the services their workflow is, uh, has to communicate to uh, have an intermittent failure. As we have seen here, uh, our UI has stopped showing progress and we don't have this patient on board. Now, if we look at the temporal web UI, we see that uh, even though our services have failed, we have not failed our workflow execution. And we still see the onboarding workflow, in this case, the new one is running. So let's go ahead and bring our services back up. Let's say our failure has been fixed and let's <laughs> see what happens. And again, we did not write any code for this. We did not have to specify in our workflow anything. This comes by default by using Temporal. Uh, and let's see if Temporal uh, is able to deal with the failure. See now our workflow has resumed once our services came back up. We were retrying basically, our workflow was retrying 
to invoke these activities. As soon as they're back up, the retry stopped, and we were able to uh, onboard uh, Mary into our system. And again, if we look here, we can see now that our workflow has completed. All right, that's all I had for today. I hope you guys enjoyed. I hope you enjoyed the conference and have a great day. Thank you. Bye.